Welcome again to another session of um, uh, race and policing, uh, com uh, the conversations on race and policing. And we have, as usual, every week we have a very special guest and this week is no exception. Uh, but first, as always, uh, I would like to introduce uh, a student in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, Jade McDonald, who will um, read uh, our land acknowledgement. Jade. Hello, everyone. I hope y'all are doing well. Um, today, we recognize that California State University of San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and Indigenous peoples. And now I will pass it over to Professor Murray to introduce our guests. Thank you, Jade. Um, it's a pleasure today to in introduce uh, Dr. Joseph Darda. He's an associate professor of English at Texas Christian University. He's the author of uh, most recently, How White Men Won the Culture Wars, A History of Veteran America from University of California Press this year, 2021. Prior to that, also uh, is the author of Empire of Defense, Race and the Cultural Politics of Permanent War from the University of Chicago Press. His next book upcoming is The Strange Career of Racial Liberalism. Um, and that's forthcoming from Stanford uh, University Press. And with that kind of output, I do want to ask what Professor Darda has for breakfast, uh, cranking out books uh, with, that, with that kind of speed. Um, I will share links to those books and to Professor Darda's faculty page uh, for those who want to uh, pick them up. I'll send them out in the chat. For all of our attendees, you can uh, weigh in at any point during the Q&A with questions or comments. Um, and, um, and without further ado, uh, please join me in, in welcoming uh, Professor Joseph Darda. Thank you, uh, Professor Murray, for that introduction. And thanks to all the organizers for uh, inviting me and for hosting me today. I'm really excited to, to be with you, um, albeit virtually. Um, and I'm just going to real quickly pull up uh, a slideshow that I want to begin with. Um, and so uh, we tested this, this out beforehand. So hopefully it continues to, to work for us. Okay, so hopefully that's visible to you. Um, so uh, my plan for, uh, for this afternoon is that um, I want to talk for about 20 minutes um, and share some of my recent research with you, which I've titled here, The Whiteness of Blue Lives. Um, however, I realize this is the uh, Conversations on Race and Policing series, not the me talking at you about race and policing series. So I hope we can get to that. Uh, that phase, uh, the phase in which you ask questions and make your own comments uh, as quickly as possible. So I'll try to keep my remarks uh, brief here. Um, so this, um, this research that I'm gonna be sharing with you today um, really stems from an interest that, uh, that I've taken in my research over the, past, um, over the past five or six years, which is in the ways in which, often the curious ways in which white men have claimed racial and gender entitlements in veiled ways after civil rights and feminism, often in the form uh, I suggest in, in the book that Professor Murray mentioned, uh, by channeling their identities through veteran identities or through the concept of military service, if not the action of military service. And this proves true as well, I wanna suggest today in what we see in the emergence in the 2010s of the Blue Lives Matter counter movement, counter to the Black Lives Matter movement. And so here's the book that Professor Murray mentioned um, that I want to briefly um, uh, briefly summarize just to give you a sense of the way in which today's talk sort of grows out of that research. So this is a book I, I published earlier this year called How White Men Won the Culture Wars, A History of Veteran America. And I look at the way in which this 
broad contingent of white men, conservative and liberal, veteran and non-veteran, rich and poor, come together in what I describe as a racial reunion in the wake of the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War. And this plays out in a lot of different domains, um, in, uh, in psychiatric care, in film, in literature, and you can see here a couple of examples of this. Bruce Springsteen on his Born in the USA tour in 1984. And on the right there is Sylvester Stallone starring in the first Rambo film, First Blood, in 1982. Um, and this is familiar to many people that if you have ever watched a Vietnam War film from the 1970s or 1980s, you'll know that uh, the American veteran is almost uniformly raced white and gendered male. Um, and this, um, this historical, historical revisionism, of course, necessitates the erasure of the often disproportionate service of Black and Latinx service people on the U.S. side, and of course, the far greater loss and suffering of Southeast Asians during that war. This is often, however, described by cultural historians as an effect of white male power, who controls Hollywood, white men, therefore they make films that tend to privilege that perspective. And I argue in this book that in fact, it's precisely this deep affiliation with military, between military service and white male identity that in fact is a source of white male power and entitlement. Um, and I wanna to suggest today that there are certain strategies that the Blue Lives Matter movement borrows from this earlier movement that that recognized, as I, as I put in the book, that army green sells better than white. And I think that proves true as well for police blue. And I wanna look at the ways in which, um, in the ways in which that's played out over the past 10 years. When Colin Kaepernick took a knee against police killings of black people, Congress took a stand for blue lives. In 2018, a coalition of conservative and liberal legislators, including most members of the House Freedom Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus, backed a bill that would make it a hate crime to knowingly assault a law enforcement officer. The bill's authors argued without evidence that attacks on officers had escalated and demanded coverage under civil rights law as crimes stemming from a kind of, kind of anti-blue racism. The Protect and Serve Act of 2018, better known as the Blue Lives Matter bill, sailed through the House in a vote of 382 to 35. Orrin Hatch, the long-serving conservative from Utah, introduced it in the, in the Senate to counter what he described as heinous, cowardly assaults on police. Democrats signed on, vowing to make sure that all of our officers, quote, know we have their back. In the fifth year of the Black Lives Matter movement, with officer deaths nearing an all-time low, conservatives and liberals came together to declare that blue lives mattered more. The Protect and Serve Act borrowed language from a wave of legis legislation at the state level. In 2016, John Bell Edwards, the Democratic governor of Louisiana, signed the first Blue Lives Matter bill into law. More than 20 other states introduced their own, including South Carolina, which, as more than a few critics observed, lacked a hate crime statute to which it could add officers. The bills answered demands from the Blue Lives Matter counter movement, which had formed after the murder of two NYPD officers in late 2014, and received the endorsement of the Fraternal Order of Police, the nation's largest law enforcement organization. When Edward signed Louisiana bill, adding officers and firefighters to the state's hate crime statutes, Chuck Canterbury, shown here, the president of the FOP, described it as a long overdue recognition of anti-blue bias. Quote, since 1999, we've been saying that police officers that are ambushed merely for the color of their uniform are being subjected to hate crimes, he said in an interview with NPR. The order's executive board then consisted of seven white men, including Canterbury, who often made allusions to the civil rights movement merely for the color of their uniform in advocating for himself and other officers. Although the Fraternal Order of Police leans conservative and Blue Lives Matter bills had more success in red states, the legislation did not belong to the right, but at least until the summer of 2020, formed a broad consensus among conservatives and liberals. President Barack Obama, for example, signed the Blue Alert Act into law in 2015, creating a national communications network modeled after Amber Alerts for collecting and sharing information regarding threats to officers' lives. Nancy Pelosi, the longtime House Democratic leader, voted for the Protect and Serve Act, along with 161 of her Democratic colleagues. 
In the wake of the 2015 Charleston church shooting, in which 21-year-old Dylan Roof, seeking to foment a race war, murdered nine black churchgoers, liberal news media committed more resources to investigating the networks online and off that had attracted Roof's generation to neo-Confederate, neo-Nazi, and neo rhodesian ideologies. Roof subscribed to them all, and they should. But I want to suggest today that stories about self-declared race warriors can also distract us from the more mundane forms that white racial dominance takes in the United States. Reading about someone like Roof, in fact, makes white people feel secure because they know they would never say or do what he did. Most white people don't make declarations about their racial identities. They don't issue manifestos or sew Rhodesian flags onto their clothes, but rather find other outlets through which to, adv to advance their racial interests. Most frame their racial demands as either skating below, that is individual, or rising above, that is universal, identitarian concerns, balancing an assertion of radical individualism with a racial claim to the nation, feigning colorblindness while dressing white skin in NYPD blue or USMC green, binding whiteness to the badge and to the flag. White men who have never worn a uniform often benefit the most from calls for police and veterans rights because the whiteness of the officer and the vet in the national imagination allows them to claim their grievances and entitlements when it serves them and set them aside when it doesn't. It's a mutable form of identity. Not all officers are white, of course, nor all vets, but all blue lives are because white people invented them to undercut black demands. Civil rights organizations condemn the Blue Lives Matter bill for distorting civil rights law. Quote, hate crimes are about an identity-based bias, an immutable characteristic that a person cannot change, a Louisiana organizer told the New York Times in 2016, after her state enacted the first Blue Lives Matter law. Adding a professional category, she added, changes and confuses the meaning of that. The bills confused identities with uniforms, awarding redundant legal armor to police. Most states, most state legal codes, including Louisiana's, mandated increased sentences for assaults on officers without an addition of hate crime safeguards. But the civil rights organizers' observation also gestured to how white men had held on to their racial and gender status after civil rights and feminism, through mutable identities constructed in the image of the officer and the vet that allowed them to bridge conservative colorblindness and liberal multiculturalism, the two dominant racial ideologies of the late 20th century. Conservatives could celebrate white officers and vets as deracinated embodiments of the nation, Liberals, meanwhile, could treat them as minoritized heroes whose voices must be heard. The Blue Lives Matter counter movement wielded that is an old trick, hailing white men as universal and marginal, as uh, deracinated, that is, identified with state issue uniforms, and minoritized, that is, deserving hate crime safeguards. White men who claim blue lives assert their national belonging as agents of the law while bemoaning that the law doesn't serve them as blue minorities. What did they do, they ask, to be so white and blue? In 1993, Cheryl Harris, someone who may be familiar to many of you, then teaching at the Chicago Kent College of Law after a stint in the city attorney's office, contributed a field-defining article to the Harvard Law Review, tracing the legal construction of, as her title announced, whiteness as property. In the 1930s, Harris's grandmother, a light-skinned Black woman, moved from the South to Chicago, where, struggling to raise her two daughters, she sought a job at a segregated retail store in the Central Business District. She got the job, and the job got her and her daughters through some lean times. No one at the store ever knew that she lived on the South Side, a Black woman working in a white store. Harris's grandmother could see that whiteness had a cash value. It constituted a kind of asset. When she walked into that store as a white woman, she crossed a material line, not her granddaughter wrote, merely passing, but trespassing. From the founding of the nation, whiteness has, through an ever-shifting racial calculus, cohered as a material belonging, a status that entitled men to land and to the value of their own labor. The law designated it, designated it as a condition for the theft of indigenous lands and black lives, a man that is needed to own his whiteness before he could own land and other people. Laws changed over time, but as Harris's grandmother knew, whiteness remained and remains a treasured asset in the United States, where it can be the difference between surviving hard times and not making it at all. Harris's characterization of her grandmother's racial transgression as a crime, not merely passing, but trespassing, 
suggests how that material whiteness has endured for so long. The legal construction of whiteness coincided with the establishment of some of the first modern police departments, which served to secure the holdings of white elites from the assumed threat of indigenous and black people without legal claim to their own assets, neither land nor often their own bodies. White landowners demanded the, the whiteness of blue lives and blue lives fortified that white wealth. White claims to blue lives have often surfaced at times of black gains from reconstruction to the civil rights era to the election of the first black president, allowing white men to act out their racial interests without acknowledging them as racial at all. In his 1935 classic, Black Reconstruction in America, W.E.B. Du Bois traced the end of Reconstruction to the, the decision of white laborers to align themselves with white landowners rather than black laborers. That is to form a cross-class racial coalition rather than a cross-racial class coalition. White owners encouraged white laborers to invest in their racial interest, to invest in their whiteness as what Du Bois famously called a sort of public or psychological wage. White workers received that racial wage in the form of enfranchisement, education, racial deference, and in an often overlooked dimension of Du Bois' famous claim, inclusion in police departments and the army. The police were drawn from their ranks and the courts dependent upon their votes treated them with such leniency as to encourage lawlessness, he wrote. White owners would not share their wealth with white laborers, but they would let them wear blue, and green, safeguarding their wealth at home and securing their fortunes abroad. Du Bois described the white racial wage as a feeling of national belonging conferred on white men through an identification with uniforms that authorized state violence. In the years after World War II, blue lives turned red, white, and blue. Thousands of white men returned from combat where they had served in segregated units and brought their training as soldiers and Marines to their local sheriff's office. From, for them, a war on crime felt like a natural continuation of their service. William Parker, who you can see here on the left cleaning some lint off of an officer's uniform, the chief of the LAPD from 1950 until his death in 1966, led the militarization of law enforcement, which earned him the condemnation of civil rights leaders and admiration in Life Magazine as the nation's second most respected law enforcement officer behind J. Edgar Hoover. Parker had served in the World War, overseeing General Dwight Eisenhower's police and prisons plan for the European invasion, and returned to California with a war-mindedness he never lost. In a 1952 address to the National Automatic Merchandising Association, a trade association for vending machine businesses in Chicago with the ominous title, Invasion from Within, he described police as borrowing and amending the nickname for the British Army, a thin blue line, standing between, quote, the law-abiding elements of society and the criminals that prey upon them. Parker's professionalization, a term he used to mean militarization, of the LAPD had transformed Los Angeles into, he told the Chicago audience, quote, the nation's white spot in the black picture of rising crime. Parker believed that the nation faced an invasion from within, an invasion that originated from LA's black and Latinx neighborhoods and necessitated a blue army to combat it. He broadcast that belief through his office, but also as a consultant on the radio and TV drama Dragnet and the genre that it all but invented. When the Civil Rights Commission asked him in 1960 about accusations of anti-Black racism against him and the LAPD, he answered, quote, I think the greatest dislocated minority in America today are the police. Parker could see before the civil rights legislation of the mid-1960s, before the Johnson, Nixon, and Reagan administration's wars on crime, before the Blue Lives Matter bills of the 2010s, the value of blue lives to white interests. He turned his white officers into embodiments of the nation, soldiers in a war on crime, while maintaining that no one lived more marginal lives in anti-blue America. In 2014, with police killings of unarmed black people in the headlines, Andrew Jacob, a white University of Michigan student, sat down in his dorm room and designed a flag for officers, a black and white American flag with a horizontal blue line below the stars. He named it with an unknowing nod to Parker, the thin blue line flag. Jacobs ordered a thousand flags from an overseas manufacturer and created an Amazon store. 
The flags sold out. He ordered more and they sold out again. He and his friend, Peter Pete Forehand, uh, Forehand is shown on, uh, on the left there, and that is Jacob on the right. A white UM classmate founded Thin Blue Line USA and over the coming months sold tens of thousands of flags and added more merchandise, including sweatshirts, window decals, bracelets, beer co coolers, dog and cat accessories, and onesies for infants. And I'm sure you've all seen uh, this, um, this, uh, this symbol um, in various, various other contexts. Jacob and Forehand first met on their high school swim team in West Bloomfield, Michigan, an affluent Detroit suburb. Neither came from law enforcement families, but they felt that officers did not receive the veneration they deserved and wanted to honor their service. Quote, the black above represents citizens and the black below represents criminals, Jacob told the Detroit News in 2017, describing his design. So the thin blue line separates the two and maintains order. The flag signifies a nation facing, as Parker might have said, a war from within, with a blue army standing between besieged citizens and invading criminals. Thin Blue Line USA later added a line of shirts and hats that combined Jacob's flag design with the logo of the Punisher, the Marvel anti-hero who first arrived in Spider-Man comics in 1974 as an Italian-American Vietnam veteran waging a vigilante war on street crime, that is, a minoritized ethnic American and veteran American turned blue American. Introducing a new black, white, and blue Punisher hat, Thin Blue Line's law enforcement liaison said, quote, at the end of the day, whether on this earth or somewhere else, the criminal always gets punished. Although Klansmen and neo-Nazis carried the Thin Blue Line flag next to the Confederate Southern Cross in a Nazi swastika at the 2017 Unite the Right March in Charlottesville, Virginia, and rioters stormed the Capitol with it on January 6, 2021, Jacob and Forehand maintained their distance from, without denouncing, their torch-bearing customers. The two white men who built a business out of a movement countering the assertion that Black Lives Matter insisted that these sold their flags to take a stand not against Black people, but for police officers. That message worked, attracting conservatives and liberal officials who either believed that officers needed the refuge of hate crime laws or knew that to say otherwise would be to risk their offices and careers. The whiteness of blue lives allowed white men, including men who had never worn a uniform, and in fact, those men most of all, to imagine themselves at the center and margin of national life, universal Americans in blue and minoritized blue Americans. Although the large scale Black Lives Matter demonstrations of 2020 threatened to reveal the white racial interests embedded in the government's recurring wars on crime and terrorism, white officers and veterans continue to form a rare site of consensus in the new culture wars. No one wins in a culture war except, for now at least, white men dressed in blue and army green. No one needed to tell the 45th president of the United States who wielded blue lives against black lives and veterans against kneeling black athletes. Two weeks after taking office, Donald Trump signed an executive order directing Attorney General Jeff Sessions to review legal strategies for enhancing the rights and resources of law enforcement. Sessions lifted restrictions on access to grenade launchers, armored vehicles, and other cast off gear from the Pentagon. When the Times asked administration officials why local police departments needed the 1,600 bayonets that they claimed a 2015 Obama executive order had denied them, the officials caught off guard, suggested that they could be used to cut seatbelts. Quote, we must confront and condemn dangerous anti-police prejudice, President Trump declared in 2018 at the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, where Canterbury, the FOP president, introduced him as the headliner of a Peace Officers Memorial Day event. Can you believe there's prejudice with respect to our police, he asked the audience of uniformed officers and their families, who nodded. The people who benefit most from the assertion that blue lives matter don't often walk the beat themselves. Some sell flags and sweatshirts, some run for office, some do nothing. Trump dragged some of the ugliest white supremacist substructures of the nation out from under a thin veil, but he never forgot that blue still sells better than white. That night, he ordered that the White House be lit with blue lights to honor fallen officers. The lights, amid a storm, crossed with lightning, blazed through the night, leaving visitors with a haunting image of whiteness after civil rights, a big white house that could almost, if you don't look too close, be blue.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Darda. That was uh, quite uh, eye-opening, quite eye-opening. Uh, Jeremy, did you want, did you have some comments that you wanted to make? Um, yeah, I, I really, um, I think this is essential uh, to the conversation that we've been having for the last year in this series. Um, the kind Actually, of- Actually, almost two years, maybe? Oh, wow, yeah, it's, it's gonna be, uh, yeah. well, a year and yeah. a half. It, time so. flies, time flies when you're having fun. This is number <laughs> 51, I think, in the, yeah. in the series. But I, I think that this is, kind, this is essential, the, the, the kind of um, long conversation to unpack a soundbite, the, the, the soundbite of Blue Lives Matter. And, and so, I mean, speaking of the sort of duration of these conversations, um, this seems to be what's required. Um, and I wonder, to put you on the spot for a minute, Joe, because I didn't ask you this in advance, but um, do you have uh, a, a way of speaking with people who, who may invoke this kind of shibboleth, this, this, this kind of um, soundbite, of responding to them in a way that, that uh, or, or, or is this simply a no-go zone in terms of the way this, this sort of conversation takes place? Um, I feel like uh, while the long conversation is necessary, is there a way to um, to engage in a productive conversation um, with people who are going to invoke this kind of, um, you know, Blue Lives Matter cloaking of, uh, of, of white supremacy, uh, maybe not realizing what they're doing. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, you know, and I, I, um, I live in Texas, uh, so this is something I have uh, some experience with, um, and you're right, um, these are very these are very touchy things, um, and you know there there is an easy sort of counterattack to the work that I've I've done over the past few years that I have to be wary of, which is well you just you're just you know slamming veterans and you're slamming police officers, right? And these are working class class people who perhaps have no better option, right? And so you, we need to be mindful uh, mindful of that, and that's a it's a valid it's a valid point, point. Um, and I think that for me the the key sort of starting point for that conversation is thinking about about whose interests um, do these most serve? Um, and, and that's part of the reason that I focus on the two young men who developed the, the Thin Blue Line flag, as well as on Donald Trump, right? These are, um, these are people of uh, particular privilege who have not, in fact, served in the military, have not, in fact, uh, served in their local police departments. And part of what I want to look at or what I always try to begin with is sort of, you know, what, what makes these men who have no reason to be, to see their identities as, as somehow expressed by the military or somehow expressed by the police department, what attracts them to the symbolism of those things? Um, and, and I would, I would sort of argue it's precisely the, um, it's precisely the, the, um, the risk that one takes in appearing to potentially criticize the military or the police, um, it's a really uh, unassailable position to take, right? To say, I'm advocating for veterans or I'm advocating for, for police, right? Um, and, and so I, I try to sort of focus more on those figures. And the additional slide I showed you from my book, right, that's Bruce Springsteen and Sylvester Stallone, who I showed, right? Neither of whom served. And in fact, Springsteen has been quite open about trying to dodge his service <laughs> during the Vietnam War. Um, and, you know, I, want, I really try to look at sort of men like them, right, who from very different political persuasions are nonetheless served by the way that we've often in our national imagination bound whiteness, maleness to the military and to, to the police, um, which often come with a set of, uh, I think we could say, affirmative action measures um, for veterans and for police. And perhaps it's no wonder, therefore, that white men, after those uh, some of those that legislation is passed in the 1960s, the civil rights legislation, begin to gravitate toward um, those identifications. Thanks, Joe. And we're going to get a couple questions coming in in the chat. I want to encourage everybody to, or in the Q&A, rather. Um, I wanted to, to note uh, also the, 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 the sort of lived reality of law enforcement and, and veteran America as being overrepresentational of, uh, of minority populations. Uh, and of course, Mary, as a, as, as a, as a law enforcement veteran, um, can, can speak to this. I wonder if you've, if you've had conversations with people in law enforcement or in veteran communities um, who are also members of, of, of minority communities and, uh, and how these, these kind of 
uh, these kind of conversations might might develop in terms of taking it from the realm of rhetoric into the realm of a sort of lived experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure Mary could speak to this to better than, than I could. Um, but I will say that in those conversations that, that I have had, especially more with, with veterans groups than with um, within with law enforcement, um, I think there there's often a recognition, right? It's, it's something that we can all sort of see in sort of the way that we consume popular culture is that those experiences are very rarely reflected in popular media. Um, and, and I think, and, and I, as I sort of mentioned in the talk, you know, I think that's often attributed to, well, you know, who are the people who are given, who have the status to push through, you know, a television show or a film or publish a novel, right? It's, it's usually that that power is going to rest more often with white men. And so often we assume that that's like an effect of, um, of sort of an existing racial and gender power structure. And it's my argument in, in, in part that it's precisely the mutability of that identity, that it can be both white and not white, um, that makes it a really powerful mechanism for enacting power for white men, um, more so than just simply in effect of, you know, who's in the writing room in Hollywood or something like that, which might be the easier thing to reach to if you're trying to explain why do uh, procedural police uh, shows look a certain way or why do uh, war films always seem to focus on the working class white guy? I, I recall um, <clears throat> when I was doing my dissertation on um, the LA Sheriff's Department, uh, speaking with a man who was this, the, the, the highest ranking African-American in the Sheriff's Department, very highly educated man. He was like two ranks below the, the sheriff and um, <clears throat> had a very frank conversation with him about white supremacy, racism, and uh, he made a, you know, just a stunning statement to me. He said, if I weren't here, uh, what would happen? You know, he said, I feel like being around that table uh, has helped the black community and the brown community and poor communities. Um, it was, you know, just really stunned me because I had not heard it put quite like that before. But, you know, moving down the ranks, uh, the average person of color, um, I, I can't say that. I just can only, you know, anecdotally, um, the, my friends in the sheriff's department, uh, they understood racism. They understood white supremacy. And they, you know, to a, to a lesser extent, they were able to articulate what this, what this uh, uh, high-ranking officer did, you know, that uh, I, I need to be here. You know, I need to be here. But there were times when, you know, black and white officers drew down on each other in the parking lot after after work, you know, how how they um, uh, would would freeze each other out if you didn't go along with the program. So you're always doing this calculation, you know, how far can I push this? Um, how much, how, how, how quick can I be to tell this one officer to back down, you know, because I, I've seen officers in the middle of a crowd of angry, angry people, um, you know, do some crazy things, you know, like yelling at people and, you know, knowing that you're outnumbered. And, uh, and there's this thing about whiteness, though, you think it's, you're, you're not going to get hurt, you know, and, and you, you say to people, wait a minute, maybe we should, the best thing to do would be to get in the car and just back down the street and get, get the heck out of here until uh, until reinforcements come. And so it's it's the, the the rank and file person of color in policing. And I've you know, and I'm sure you have, Joe, uh, read enough about this. To, they, they understand quite quite well, you know, white supremacy and racism in these departments. And um, sometimes they are not accepted by their own communities. Uh, they're not accepted by their white officers, so they they find themselves in this um, in this no man's land, uh, more or less. Um, but they, you know, it, it it's it's a uh, a good profession in terms of you know very basic things like benefits and and you know beats being a lineman, I guess, you know, or uh, you know working out outdoors in uh, or in an office, you know, that's that was my motivation for for going into policing. I just did not want to want to do that. Um, so it's it's very, very difficult though. There, you know, you have to have 
the Association of Los Angeles Deputy Sheriffs, and then you have to have the Black Association of Los Angeles Deputy Sheriffs because the Association of Los Angeles Deputy Sheriffs are not representing my voice in, in this whole thing, you know. Uh, and, and we find many times that unions are some of the, the worst actors in, in this drama. So, yeah. Uh, I think we have a few questions, uh, yep. some of which are kind of, you know, intriguing, don't you think, Jeremy? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you want to read those, Mary, or should I? I, I can read the first one. Uh, do you believe campus police are complicit or even implicit in these so-called universal identity where white and blue lives are conflated? I think you can go a lot of places with that one. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, and I, I, I teach at a, you know, at a predominantly white institution and, uh, you know, many of my students of color will, will tell me about their interactions with the campus police, um, which I think takes a different, um, <clears throat> takes a different tenor than maybe interacting with the Fort Worth Police Department. Um, it tries to make it much more, it, it, it tries to sort of enact a kind of community mindedness that I don't, uh, that I don't think comes across whatsoever to the students who are being asked <laughs> why they're on campus. Um, but, but I do think, you know, at, you know, at universities, I think it, it's, it's, um, it's one of those things that I think raises the question of sort of how does their, their very presence on campus. So at TCU, for example, our, our, um, uh, our police, uh, don't carry weapons, for example. Um, but I think that just the presence of the badge can kind of reshape, um, uh, that environment, um, in ways that, um, you know, I mean, as as I'm sure that this group is who's been attending many of these events in the past, right? It, it provides security for some, and precisely the opposite for others, right? And mm -hmm. and so, um, so I and I do think I I don't know how that maybe works out in terms of um, of identification necessarily, since that's sort of like I'm, I'm sort of thinking about that on sort of this this broader scale, I suppose. Um, but you can certainly see it in sort of the, you know, the, the way in which I think a lot of my, especially white male students sort of respond to having the police on campus. They're very chummy, right? They sort of want to sort of like welcome them on campus. And, um, and our, our police officers at TCU, I've actually never encountered an officer of color at TCU, um, which I don't know what that says precisely, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, it's a fascinating question. It's something that, um, you know, I'd be welcome to hear other people's thoughts on it. It's something I've not, I would have to process more, but it's, it definitely, I think is, is an interesting, interesting territory. Well, the, the UC and the Cal State Police, they're, they're totally certified. So they're, they're, uh, they can lateral transfer to another police department and not have to undergo any more training. So they've got the, the guns and the batons and, and all of that. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm always of the opinion that if you've got those things, you want to use them, <laughs> you know, you, that's the first thing you think of, uh, but there is a, there's a movement, um, headed by, uh, not headed by, but, but, uh, uh, participated in by, uh, Dylan Rodriguez, who's, a uh, one of our colleagues from UCR, who was one of our guests, uh, a few weeks yeah. ago, I know and Dylan, he's, yeah. they're, they're very, very serious. You know, they want to get rid of police on campus. And when you think about statistics, Statistically, really not needed. Really not needed. Not not with all that weaponry, anyway. Uh, you know, we we certainly need people to enforce parking and to settle minor disputes. But rarely, things rarely happen on a college campus that require you know an armored car or anything. I mean, it's just it's uh, it's it's overkill. And I think with the militarization of policing in the last few years. Uh, you have the college campus police who want to get in on it, you know, to get all that, those goodies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. I think this is, you know, to Professor Rodriguez's sort of position, like I think it is, it's one of those things too, where it's a, it's a challenge for us to imagine otherwise, right? We've sort of gotten accustomed to the fact sure. that police are present on university and college campuses and it, it feels natural because we've been there for a long time, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's any, it's, it's an essential part of a campus environment, um, which, um, which I guess is in, in many ways the challenge of abolitionism um, more yeah. broadly beyond the, yes. the university space. Yeah, yeah. I was going to suggest that that's, that's part of that bigger picture, you know, because policing is something, policing the way we see it today is something that we just always had, right? It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's just always been there and we've never questioned it. 
And it appears now that uh, that even that is not a sacred cow, as not as sacred as, as it used to be anyway. Uh, do you want to read the second, the next question, Jeremy? Yeah, I'll jump in uh, the um, uh, from uh, Fope uh, Adesina. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Darda. This presentation was so contextually poignant. Can you please summarize, and you touched on this, I think, with a roof uh, note. Can you please summarize neo rhodesian ideology? Oh, yeah. Neo well, I don't know that it's essential to, the, to, the, to this context, but, you know, Rhodesia, you know, I think South Africa is more familiar to, to many people. Um, but, uh, but Rhodesia had a, has, had a similar sort of system of, of apartheid that, uh, and sort of white racial dominance in Africa that, um, as a result, sort of became this, um, this symbol for white, you know, I mean, I think part of what is, is bizarre and scary about Dylan Roof's uh, um, iconography is how did this kid born in like the like mid 90s ever come to um, adopt uh, Rhodesian paraphernalia and symbolism when um, you know that was that was in fact a state that no longer existed by the time he was born um, and so so I think the point there is is less sort of the the explicit history of Rhodesia which I doubt Dylan Roof knew of necessarily but the sort of the crossover of various symbols of of white supremacy. And, you know, if there's one book that I can recommend, I don't know if she's been part of the series yet, but Kathleen Ballou um, at University of Chicago, who wrote a book about uh, the white power movement as it rose in the 70s and 80s. And she talks a lot about the ways in which the very, very early internet, like the 1980s early internet, was import an important ground for many of these these small white supremacist communities in the United States to sort of cross over and share these symbols. And she uses Dylan Roof as this example of like, this is unimaginable 40 years ago that you could see someone with this army jacket on that has like six different white supremacist symbols that are sort of all intersecting. Um, and she sort of credits that. We think of course about the effect of social media today, but she goes back to like these very early, like these this very, very early internet um, in the, like the early 1980s and sort of looks at the way in which that early on, you already get these, this sort of weird crossover that leads us to, you know, the right, the Unite the Right rally where you have every kind of white supremacist symbol sort of all represented in this single event. I, I learned something new. I, I never heard that before. <laughs> Neo Rhodesian, that's, you know, that is totally obscure. <laughs> I, I think the obscurity of it is kind of part of the, the cachet. I, I, I have always been uh, befuddled by the Stahlhelm on uh, a motorcycle riders. That is the, the, the Nazi Germany. It's actually <laughs> originally an American design, also used in nationalist China. But the, the Nazi Germany helmets. And I, and, and I looked it up, and I found that actually Hell's Angels, who had been veterans, um, mm -hmm. had taken these as trophies, probably of Nazis they had killed or been in battle with and wore them as a sign in the, in the late 40s and, and 50s of, of their, their anti-fascist, you would think, uh, credentials. And something happened there, some confusion, whether, you know, so, so, so that I think it's, it's good not to underestimate the confusion of, of some of these people um, in terms of the, the, the symbology of, of what they're engaging with. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I think a lot of people wear this Nazi helmet, maybe not knowing it's Nazi, but maybe knowing it is and, well, and willfully not realizing that that the tradition among american bikers to wear it was because they were they they were the they you know world war ii veterans were the original antifa i mean mm -hmm. they, they were they were out there fighting fascists fighting nazis mm -hmm. um i it's it's a bit conf I, I think confused and confusing right yeah you know, it's interesting I, there's a oh sorry go on mary no please go ahead go ahead oh i was just going to add sort of on that on that topic you know i talked a little bit about the punisher um, you know, and I think that that's another example where I think sometimes people don't really know what they're wearing, I think, you know, because the Punisher as this, this Marvel character, I think it, it means something very particular to people who are familiar with its associations. Um, but I think that, that a lot of people, you know, will wear, you know, I'll see people wearing Punisher shirts at the gym. And um, I, I'm not sure that they have the, the same sort of understanding of sort of what, um, <laughs> what that means as a symbol and sort of its deeper, its deeper associations. Um, and uh, so, yeah, some, sometimes those symbols, I think, get away from, uh, get away from the people who sometimes are um, displaying them. You know, I, I uh, when you, when you began talking, you, you talked about the, 
sort of conflation of policing and military, right? Uh, and I know when, when I first went on the Sheriff's Department, there were a slew of Vietnam veterans who, who were hired and that's always been so attractive to police departments. You know, we were, we were recruiting in Iowa and Idaho for veterans, right? Uh, and, and, and Orange County, none from South Central LA, but from Orange County. And they even used terms like, and I think I've said this before in this space, like in country and um, Indian country uh, and calling people by, uh, you know, these horrible names that, you know, com comparable to like Gook uh, and, and other names they called uh, the Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese military as well as the Vietnamese citizens. And so it was, it, it was a little bit confusing as a 21 year old to hear these, these salty guys, you know, going out and, and acting as if they were still in Vietnam. It was really, really scary. Catholic school girl, Catholic college, and here I am caught in the middle of all of this craziness. And I know that we have uh, veterans now, you know, from Afghanistan and Iraq, and and uh, I think that's what's still happening. I, I don't think, you know, you, we've changed the, the face of policing from, you know, uh, you know, Los Angeles has a brown sheriff now supposedly a brown sheriff and he's acting more like a white supremacist than than any any sheriff i ever saw you know from peter pitches to um you know sherman block you know these these people were were good politicians anyway because you do have to be a good politician and these got this man is not even a good politician you know he's just i i don't like that law i'm not going to enforce it you know it's it's uh it's pretty scary uh before we run out of time i guess we need to get on to more questions jeremy i can read through a couple of these um, if you don't Mario, mind uh yeah it says uh dr darda do you uh speak about how black veterans would experience red lining when coming back from the war whereas white veterans were able to take advantage of their gi bill uh in the housing market yeah i i do right and i think and i think that one thing that's really important to, to point out in that respect is that i think we think about we associate that um the inaccessibility of gi benefits to uh to black veterans we associate that with world war um world war ii and the, the first gi bill um but but much of that continues in the post-vietnam era as well and i think it's an important thing to sort of uh to keep in mind in terms of who is able to access the benefits that uh that come from uh, that come from that service, and um, you know, I think that this is um, that this this again sort of gets back to sort of the wider significance of kind of the whitening of the Vietnam War and sort of what that looked like um, in the 1970s. And, and you know, one example of of this that I, I I think if it wasn't for popular culture, this couldn't have taken shape um, in terms of Vietnam War films and everything else. Uh, this is a California case, which may be familiar to, to you, the, the Bakke versus the, uh, the Regents of the University of California case, the 1978 case, uh, that, uh, is perhaps most famously known as the reverse racism case, um, where a, uh, a white man who was a Vietnam veteran was denied entry into the then very new UC Davis Medical School. And he, you know, claimed that he was being discriminated against. This is this is the case that eliminated the possibility of, of quota systems. What UC Davis was trying to do, like many other medical schools, was saying, black communities don't have enough doctors to serve those communities. We need to train more black doctors. Therefore, we are going to commit to training a certain number of black doctors per year. This, for Baki and his lawyer, constituted anti-white racism. Um, and I think one thing that's often overlooked about that Baki case is precisely the way in which the angle that his lawyer took was not representing Baki as a white man who was making this grievance case about being white. It was really wrapped up in his vet, in his service, in his military service, saying, you know, uh, Baki deserves a spot in this medical school, not, not because necessarily he is one of the 100 best applicants, but because he served his country and he therefore deserves this um, uh, this spot. Um, and so, uh, and, and I think that the sort of, that that wouldn't have been possible if not for a certain wave of fictional representations of veterans as uniformly being white up until that point before the Baki case um, and around the time of the Baki case. 
Thanks, Joe. Um, I'm going to uh, jump to uh, Matt's question. Robert Peel, the father of modern policing, laid out certain principles, including, quote, police are the public and the public are the police, end quote. Do you see current policing as a microcosm of society as a whole, or is it reactionary? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and again, you know, I don't want to over, I, obviously I wrote a book that was about the military and about sort of veteran culture. So I don't want to overplay the parallel, but I do think that these two things have taken similar shape you know, over the past few decades, which is that, you know, we've never had a police draft, um, but, you know, of course, after Vietnam, we eliminate the military draft and you get, I think, a very different, a different kind of military when it's an all volunteer force. And I sort of put volunteer in quotation marks because a lot of people who are serving are doing so in order to get to college education, not necessarily because they're gung ho about being, uh, being a soldier or being a Marine. Um, but I think, I think something similar has happened, um, with, with, Police, and I think it has something to do as well with the close affiliation between the military and policing. Um, I think that there is um, there's a there's a closer there's a there's an affiliation between that that I think has an effect. I, mean, I can't remember what Trump won. I think the um, Trump won the the veteran vote. I want to say in 2016 by something ridiculous like 30 points. Um, I don't know what those numbers would be for for police officers, but I do think that there's this gradual pull in that direction. And I don't know what is, you know, what's the causal force there, but um, that's radically different um, from just a few decades ago when it was a 50-50 split um, in terms of um, who was supporting which major political party. Um, so, so I would say to, to, your, to the question, you know, no, I don't think the police are particularly representative anymore. I don't think they're representative of, of the community. And, um, and yeah, I think that's a, that's a problem in the military and it's a problem um, as well. Um, with with law enforcement that's a shock that that it changed so much in um in in one or two election cycles wow um has, but has ha, have the police ever been sort of um a microcosm of the community have they ever yeah i don't think so i mean i you know obviously i cherry picked the photos you know but you look at that <laughs> photo of like william parker you know with his yeah. uh his military, militarized police officers all lined up, right? Um, they're sort of uniformly like 28 year old white men, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, you know, I mean, and obviously today is a little different than, than maybe assembling uh, the LAPD in 1955, but, uh, but you know, nonetheless, um, I think both in terms of the barriers to entry to the profession, but also I think increasingly that those who are attracted to the profession as well. You know, Mary, you spoke to the fact that, you know, for some black police officers, they feel sort of caught between a rock and a hard place, right? They sort of not supported maybe by their superior officers. And they also maybe get some backlash from their own communities, neighborhoods in terms of, you know, why, why did you, why did you join the, the, the police force? Right. Um, and so I think that that has to have an effect on, you know, the shape ultimately of, uh, of law enforcement, especially in, um, in, in cities. So how 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 do we? I'm sorry, Jeremy. Jeremy, I'm I'm sort of butting in here, but how? I I, I think there's just been this. Uh, you know, we've we're butting our heads up against a wall or a rock or whatever the last uh, few months because we have been discussing all of these problems in policing. We have more or less, in my mind anyway, concluded that policing is really the first line of defense in terms of white supremacy. You know, the police in my neighborhood in South Central LA was keeping us away from the good white people in Hollywood and Beverly Hills and places like that. And and maybe they've prettied it up a little bit more, you know, with, with having people of color, you know, sort of on the posters and everything, but has it really changed that drastically? You know, like I was saying, you know, we don't have a Parker anymore. Uh, we, but we do have, you know, that pretty face of, of the, the sheriff and, uh, and, but he's, you know, he's, spouting even worse retina well not worse than parker but you know he's he's spouting a lot of rhetoric too and he's acting as if he is a uh he's a dictator he's the king of the los angeles sheriff's department so 
how, how do we break through that white supremacist supremacist line? You know, how do we call out policing for what it is? It is the first face of white supremacy in uh, in the United States. And then come teachers and social workers and so forth. But policing, I mean, they're there. So give us a solution, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that's the big question, right? And I think I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, in terms of thinking about the the role that police play, you know, as the as the you know the front line of white supremacy and sort of maintaining um, a, a white supremacist order. Um, you know, and I I think that this sort of maybe circles back to to Jeremy's first question, at least in terms of how do we engage with how do, you know this is a you know it's a series of conversations, right? Um, and I think that a lot of this comes down to trying to move away from this this need to constantly talk about individuals who are good police officers or individuals who are particularly egregious criminals. Um, and this is the, the problem that I run into all of the time with my work around the ways in which the figure, the cultural figure of the veteran has been misdeployed and misused and abused in a way that does not at all serve uh, veterans or people who have served in, um, in US wars. Um, and, and I think part of the challenge is, is trying to, you know, in some ways raise the, raise the discourse away from, from that, right? Because it's always easy to say, you know, well, I know someone who did something really bad and then you need, you need a police officer or I, I mean, my uncle's a police officer and he's a great guy, right? right. You know, none of those things are, are incorrect, right? Yeah. But I think that they distract from really what we're trying to talk about, right? Which is a, a structure and a system of power system. that is fundamentally premised on white racial dominance and anti-blackness and the way that those two things work hand in right. glove. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a thorny one though. I, I've, I've been, my partner lives in, in Minneapolis and so we've been following very closely the efforts at abolition there and what that looks like. Um, I've often thought for a long time, if you could just get rid of the guns, that would be a big move in the right direction. But then I live in Texas where there's an open carry law. So mm -hmm. you take, you, you know, you, uh, if police officers are carrying guns, then you just have a bunch of white vigilantes with guns on their hips. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a thorny, it's a thorny issue. I'm not sure that I can offer you any solutions, um, <laughs> but sort of just uh, to empathize with the, with the position. Um, you know, I can only imagine having attended just a few of the conversations over the fall, I'm sure after two years, you're like, you know, give me something. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that though that looking at you and Jeremy, um, I've often said, I, I said this to colleagues 20 years ago, that the role of whites vis-a-vis uh, -vis racism in academia is to be allies. And, and I think you all are, you know, fine examples of allies where you, you examine whiteness. And uh, it was amazing how many white people in you know this work that we're doing who were examining blackness and I, I think blackness should not be examined when it comes to systems of oppression it should be whiteness and white supremacy that should be examined and I just before we run out of time I just want to thank you for doing that because I think we need more voices like yours and Jeremy's and uh, and so many of our colleagues on our campus who are doing this work. And I know it's not popular work. I know it's, you know, doesn't make you a, a, a happy guest at Thanksgiving, for example, or, you know, we have the holidays coming up and, you know, I hear from my white students all the time, man, I had a rough Christmas this year, <laughs> you know, because of conversations that happen. Oh, this is what I heard in class and, you know, um, they they send away a high school student and, and, and Back comes a uh, a person who's re ready for the revolution, you know. So it's uh, it's it changes you. It changes your lives. So I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you. Thank thank you for saying that, and uh, and you know even more so, you know, back at you in terms of the work you've been doing for much longer. Thank you. Thank you. If it's okay, I want to take. We we do have about ten minutes. If that's if that's okay, uh, just to I I, I wanted to. Um, Joe, I don't know if you have access to the Q&A. We could do a sort of clearinghouse. And then if possible, I did want to touch on that, that third rail of critical race theory, because I know this is something that's, uh, that's directly related to your teaching. Um, but I want to first go through, run through a clearinghouse um, um, of our questions. One is on copaganda. And we did a session on that um, with Howard Henderson uh, at, at, might also be in Texas, actually. 
Um, and uh, can't, I can't remember the name of his colleague, but I, I, I posted it in the chat. Uh, can you please talk about the effectiveness of propaganda uh, from overrepresentation of mainly white women victims in true crime genre to comedies, comedies like Brooklyn Nine-Nine, uh, which I feel uh, some kind of way about enjoying, uh, Fofe says. Um, I want to, if it's okay, Joe, uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and scroll through these. Uh, Arsel asked, any thought about the new Tucker Carlson documentary, essentially shifting the blame of January 6th, uh, which of course is a classic, uh, uh, well, I won't uh, go into that. Donald, uh, Donaldo Ramirez Reyes asks for a little bit more about the symbolism of the Punisher. Uh, and you can, you can sift through these, Joe. Uh, but uh, then Jean Martinez asks, uh, what about nonprofit veteran support groups in communities that are still, that, that are often still separated by race uh, contributing to this concern? Um, um, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll actually come back to Cindy's point. Uh, Professor Darda doesn't teach at, at CSUSB. Oh, Mary, Mary teaches. She's, asked, she's asking if sociology. What Mary's teaching. Sociology to see this. I, I, did, I didn't. I don't see that. Where is that? It just came in. Just came in from uh, from Cindy Montiel. Uh, Mary teaches what, in the sociology department. Sorry, Ms. Oftar. What What do you teach at CSUSB, Mary? Oh, I teach sociology. Thank you for asking, Cindy. I'll turn it over to you, Joe, on those those questions. Yeah, you know, maybe I can wrap two of them together, which is there's a question about propaganda and also about the Punisher. Um, you know, and, I, and one thing I might I might say in sort of addressing the two of those is, um, you know, one thing that that I think is is really significant in the way that um, that propaganda works is that it's, it's sort of tentacles reach well beyond what seem to be narrowly defined as sort of cop shows or cop films. Um, and I think the most obvious way in which this is manifested is in um, sort of vigilante violence that often, I think, in a more subtle way, sort of takes on the kind of sort of embodies a kind of law enforcement, um, uh, a law enforcement guise. Um, and I really think that in some ways, the Punisher is the sort of the perfect symbol of precisely what I'm talking about, which is that it's about white men who are, in fact, not police officers feeling like they identify somehow just by virtue of their race and gender as police officers, right? Yes. The vigilante figure is mm -hmm. fundamentally a white guy yeah. who thinks of himself as a cop, right? Um, with no badge. Um, and, um, and I think that's precisely the way the rhetoric of blueness and blue lives sort of works. It invites all white men to sort of join in this symbolism, even if one not only doesn't serve in a police department, but doesn't even know anyone who serves in a police department, right? It doesn't really matter um, because of the way that that, I think that sort of that culture extends out and really invites, welcomes um, white people, especially white men to sort of uh, join in that, um, to join in that, in that identification. Um, to remember the other questions, uh, which I'll pull up here, their answer. Well, the, the, the examples that I'm thinking of that you just described, Joe, are um, George Zimmerman, you know, who was, exactly. I think, a was he a security guard? Or I think self, I think self declared. I think he was yeah, just, yeah, you know, yeah. doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, and I've got someone on my, I won't say where I live, but someone on my buzz, you know, the neighborhood watch thing. And I mean, this guy is, I'm, I'm sure he's armed to the teeth. And he's always, you know, and he uses cop language, but he's not a cop, you know, it's, it's just so weird. But so I, I think you're right, though. I mean, I, I can go out in, in just anywhere and people will question me about, you know, how I park or the mask I'm wearing, or, you know, like they've got to be policing me, too. And I think a lot of white people see themselves as being policing of people of color. You know, so they'll they'll tell me, you know, you didn't stop at that stop sign back there. You know, just like they feel like they have a right to do that, right? But and and the ultimate then is George Zimmerman in the killing of Trayvon Martin. You know, but yeah. but the the judge in this new case with with the two young people who got killed, the young man is on trial. You know, the the, the details are sketchy, but I don't know if you heard what the judge said. You cannot call these two people that you killed victims. They have to be called uh, rioters. 
and and you cannot call this young man i can't remember what but it's real obvious how the judge feels about this whole thing you know he feels like this young man was out uh protecting his community so it fits you know right in with what you said yeah absolutely i think about, i mean i think about this even now as we see um and the Amazon Ring technology sort of take over. And, you know, I'd be very curious to know who is most attracted to that technology because there is this kind of security fetish that comes with like, oh, I can keep an eye on my, like the sidewalk outside my apartment sure. at all times yeah. of day yeah. and sort of yeah. who yeah. identifies with that kind of, you know, effectively sort of law enforcement um, behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and some have argued that the, the, the that racism also, uh, contributes to that by people, and you may have just implied that, people wanting to keep themselves safe in these closed communities with the ring and the, the burglar alarms and, and all of that, you know, it just, it's, it does wonders for alarm companies, you know, to, uh, and, and security guards and that kind of thing. Racism costs us a whole lot of money, a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Amazon doesn't get their packages stolen anymore. So Bezos is Bezos ah. is doing just fine. Oh yeah, there's there. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. But I, I think that big question of um, of of the, the the surveillance state and and this is the the Shoshana Zuboff uh, surveillance capitalism idea and how that plays into um, amplifying racism or uh, because of course there's also the, the the cell phone video conversation to be had and how that has changed. The, the the national conversation. So this seems like a really really rich topic. Definitely gets into the uh, the, the complex um, the complex theory of of surveillance and panopticons and that kind of thing. So we we have four minutes. I don't think we're gonna we're gonna cover it all, but maybe a future panel we can get into these these sort of surveillance and tech questions because I'd love to I'd love to get into this and how it how it either amplifies or mitigates or does both. To, to issues of racial injustice. Um, yeah, yeah, and I can't, I don't know if I can speak to, have any expertise about Tucker Carlson other than, you <laughs> oh, know, I, uh, I, I, had, I had not followed that documentary, um, though I, I do, no. I, I do fully anticipate him running for president though uh, yeah. in the near future, um, which, is, which is a scary thought. Um, and then there was, I think also maybe a question about um, nonprofit veterans groups, um, which, which was an interesting question. And I think that, you know, this is something that that I address a little bit in the book. You know, one thing that's that's really striking is that there are a lot of, and I, I'm looking at this more historically in the 70s and 80s. There were a lot of um, black veterans groups um, that formed, and um, and it really, to me, it sort of serves as a kind of counterexample of the ways in which um, it, it serves as a counterexample to the ways in which whiteness and and veteranness are sort of bound together during this period. Uh, there were a series of, of black veterans groups that came to the dedication of the, uh, the second dedication of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, DC, the 1984 dedication when they built that additional statue that a certain group of veterans wanted built because they wanted a figurative statue and not the black wall that, um, that is sort of the primary attraction of the memorial. Um, and they were protesting, you know, you know, the way in which this, you know, the symbolism did not in fact sort of represent their service. And, and it's really interesting going back to the news coverage because like the Washington Post um, and other reputable news organizations sort of dismissed them as like a bunch of kooks who were, you know, protesting and sort of ruining the, the real veterans day, right? Um, and so, so yeah, I don't know if this is the question I was asking, but I, I do feel like many of those veterans, nonprofit but veterans groups have done really important work in communities that unfortunately I think gets totally you know overlooked in, in my work but especially in, in sort of the wider pop culture um, cultural representations of veterans that we lose precisely because we're when we think veteran we're looking for a white man by virtue of the way that I think popular culture has sort of um, yeah. led us to expect a certain kind of story mm -hmm. the Tim O'Brien story the platoon story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. As a last question, because I have a lot of my students here, and, and I, would, I would love this sort of, uh, speaking of vaccines, an, an inoculation against the pollution and the, 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 the problems in terms of the conversation surrounding this term critical race theory. Oh, yeah. um, it is a, a seminar that you teach. You mentioned that you hadn't taught it since the latest um, sort of disinformation campaign emerged about it. This is something that's close to Mary's work as well. But I would love if you could take just a just a couple minutes or a minute or two um, to to talk a little bit about what it is, 
and what it isn't. Uh, and I, I don't want to ask you to do 15 weeks of a seminar in, in, in 60 seconds, but that's kind of what I am asking you to do. A, a little bit of a, of a sort of a glimpse into what it is and, and, and the disingenuous conversation surrounding it that's, that's, uh, that started uh, the last couple of months in the States. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, this is a class that I designed and have taught for a while at, at TCU. We have a comparative race and ethnic studies department and all of our majors take this class. Um, and, and yeah, I've not taught it since critical race theory became a term that was familiar to more people than, uh, you know, I normally had to begin by explaining, um, you know, introducing the term. And I think we could start from, uh, start with the controversy now when I teach it next. Um, I think that one thing, you know, in the interest of time, one just sort of one thing that, I, that I'll, I'll mention in, in this context because I think it might be helpful in terms of kind of the noise around this question is one thing that I always ran into in, in it was a, a point of confusion in my critical race theory courses is that there are really two critical race theories. Um, and one is the law school critical race theory. In my, in my uh, seminar, we would usually refer to this as CRT. We would abbreviate it. So when we're talking about CRT, we're talking about uh, Derek Bell and the sort of uh, the birth of critical race theory at law schools that descends from critical legal theory. Um, and that's a specific thing um, that is primarily interested in the way in which white supremacy is woven into the very fabric of the legal justice system in the United States. Um, critical race theory, as we would talk about in the, cla in the class, would be this this broader, this broader exploration um, that is closely related to that, but has a broader, is looking at broader systems of power beyond simply the legal justice system. Um, and so in that, even though, um, you know, you wouldn't think of like a Du Bois as, you know, as someone who'd be associated with critical race theory, we would sort of look at the ways in which someone like him would be part of this larger genealogy of critical race theory perspectives on US society that often extends to a critique uh, more broadly of Western liberalism as sort of the, the political foundation of uh, Western society. Um, and so I don't, I know we don't have time to go into any probably too much more depth, but I will just say that to me, that distinction is one that's often lost in the mainstream. I think that part of the confusion that people come to is that they read, I think, you know, like an, a profile of Derek Bell and learn a little bit about Derek, Derek Bell's career. The New Yorker did this, for example. And I feel like that doesn't give you a full, a full picture of sort of what critical race theory is, because it's not just simply law professors who are engaged in critical race theory. Um, and that was often something that my class years ago now had to deal with, was sort of like, okay, we're talking about CRT over here, and we're talking about this broader thing called critical race theory that also includes uh, legal critical race theory. Right. And, you know, I, th I think as some commentators have said, uh, it is simply um, the, the whipping up of fear of, of whites losing power, you know, which a lot of this stuff is about, and, and, and their kids' feelings getting hurt. Because critical race theory is nothing more than telling the truth. You know, telling the truth about the farm workers, telling the truth about uh, enslavement of millions of people over 250 years. I mean, that's what people are afraid of. So, uh, you know, we can put that label on it, you know, critical race theory, but I, I, I don't, you know, I've read several articles and books about it and I don't teach any differently. You know, the only thing I do differently than I did 25 years ago is I use the term white supremacy more than I sh probably should. <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's woven through the entire system. You know, it, it is the, the, the idea, you know, that we shouldn't talk about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. You know, we don't want to make our kids feel bad about Thomas Jefferson, you know. Well, you know, that uh, to me, academia has never been about making people feel bad or good. <laughs> it is about telling the truth. It's about yeah. telling the truth. Yeah, and I think in that respect, to me, I to be honest, sometimes I feel like it's not worth defending the term critical race yes. theory because right. I actually think right. the term is doing us a disservice because it, is. it, is. it yeah. descends from from legal from from critical legal sure. theory and that's why sure. it's called a theory but I think that yeah. you know whenever you label something a theory it invites this kind of skepticism yes. while you're just right. offering us uh, a set of opinions um, and I often sort of instead you know often in the classroom will talk about you know this isn't a critical race theorist, this is a, a historian of race and white supremacy. Yes. They are, they yeah. are, you yeah. know, yeah. giving us a historical perspective. They are not giving us a theory of race. Sure. Yeah, and, and in California, we have a mandate to teach ethnic studies in K through 12. 
And I think that has been conflated with critical race theory. Ethnic studies is not critical race theory and vice versa. Uh, and I think people are uh, just frightened of that. that I mean, I, I really do believe that the operative term is fear here, that people are really, really afraid. We want our country back, right? We want our country back to the 1940s and 50s. Well, my family doesn't, but you know. Thank you so much, Joe. To my uh, Matt's point about reactionary, which is a word. Yes, yes. You've yeah. got to revisit. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was. I was a delight to be a part of the conversation. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Um, thanks so much to Professor Joseph Darda for joining us today. Um, does anybody have any uh, last minute comments? I will step aside. Thank you, Joe. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Real thank you pleasure. for having me. And thank you, Jade. Are you going to join us after Jade? Yeah, I will. Good. We'll see you. See you on the other side. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Re Thank you. Write another book so we can have you back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work on it. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.